Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So, so today, I've been through several sessions today, and one of the common themes that I find that have been going around that we want to focus on is the power of engagement, but that starts with relationships. And no matter what business you're in, as we heard Horst earlier, or education systems around the world that I've worked with, we need to start with relationships. And relationships is first, by then by relevance, and then by rigor. Too often, education systems are so antiquated that we begin with rigor, then relevance, and relationships is at the end. But in 21st century skills and 21st century schools and the changing of society, we need schools that build relationships with students so for student success. So that brings me to a, a thought, a story that I once had a student that came in that had special needs and was not classified a very good student. Student was always getting in trouble. The student was always being suspended from school. And the, 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 that was the way to deal with that student is that schools would just, you know, you just go home for the day. The problem was that the student was bored out of their mind. They were sitting there, teachers were lecturing to the, that student. They were getting, they were having textbooks and they were just reading out of books. And then nobody decided to really get to know that student. So when that student came over to our school, the first thing we did is we started relationship with that student. That student was resistant because that wasn't used to that type of relationship. And then as things built on and we developed relationships with the student, what we found is that it wasn't just about the content and the standards. It was about taking the student's strengths and building upon that. And we started talking with that student about how to engage with other students. Well, we ended up having a debate, uh, a genetically modified foods debate. And that student actually won the debate against the valedictorian of the school. It changed the student's life forever because that student wasn't used to getting attention that was positive. All of a sudden students were saying, wow, I didn't, I didn't know you knew so much. Um, that was fantastic. So now the student was getting praises and, and comments from students in the positive light and developing relationships with that student. That student's parents had only a sixth grade education, year six. That student, when they graduated, graduated high school and got four offers to the university because it had changed that student. We had talked about it wasn't just about content. It was about developing oral and written communication skills, these essential skills. A lot of people call them soft skills. I don't like that term because it, it plays it down. These are essential skills for today. Oral and written communication, the ability to collaborate with others and, 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 and developing agency, student agency, work ethic, um, student efficacy as well as building these, these uh, community and critical thinking skills to be able to work with others. My aha experience that, uh, um, that brought me into two decades of working with education institutions all over the world um, was in Napa Valley where I'm from. And I had moved my company there and it's a farm town at the end of the day. I had a hard time hiring workers that had these critical thinking skills uh, and the 21st century skills. Um, we went to the school uh, board to say, what are you going to do about this? Because we might have to move because we can't grow our company here. Well, long story short, that started what is now become the new tech network with over 240 schools around the world. Um, and I will share with some of the outcomes. But I want to bring you to the story of what really shaped 
um, and changed my objective and vision, um, as Hortz uh, mentioned, but it was very pivotal. Um, we started this high school as 11th and 12th grade, so the last two years of high school, which meant that st students would have to choose this high school and switch high schools in the middle of their, uh, of their uh, high school career. And we ended up with 200 um, very underperforming students who had struggled all of their um, lives with, with school and were barely passing um, their, their classes. Well, without teaching to the test and, uh, and doing something brand new of essentially having the, the students work on projects just like my company's teams were working on projects. Um, nine months later, these students outperformed every single high school in the region by 10 to 15% in every subject in, on the standardized tests. But what was more important is that, and Susan mentioned this before, is that at, we had to kick kids out of the building at 7.30, 8.30 o'clock uh, at night because they would not leave. And these were the kids that were struggling in school and were tortured uh, by, by going to school. And yet they did not want to leave. And on weekends, it would not be uncommon to have 30, 40, 50, 60 students um, um, working in, in, this, in the school building because they had talked to one of their teachers to opening up the school building for them. And that was when my aha happened where I said, you know, if, if people are engaged and they're connected to each other, it completely changes the chemistry of motivation. It changes the uh, chemistry of the desire to for excellence, and uh, it it produces lifelong effects that in a very short period of time, in less than nine months, that uh, that replaces the path to the pre-existing pathway of failure. It replaces it with the pathway of success. And so as a network, this is 20 years later with over 240 plus schools and growing worldwide, you can see some of the results um, of, of uh, their, of even on the academic type of uh, measures uh, across the schools uh, and much higher than national average and all teaching using um, all learning through projects. And this occurs across all socioeconomic and, and age groups and, uh, and types of uh, students. And you see more than 50% are urban, uh, um, urban uh, uh, schools that traditionally have struggled in any kind of achievement. So as Ted said, the, the power of project-based learning really really engages students and gives them an opportunity to shine. But when we think of project-based learning, oftentimes we think of doing projects and doing projects is very linear. It is not project-based learning. So traditional project cycle is we'll teach something, then we'll assess something. And at the end, we present something and the synthesis doesn't happen until everything's done. And when we talk about project-based learning, these essential elements, we're talking about a very fluid that um, system where you're not only learning, you're building, you're assessing all along the way. So when we start out with a project, the first thing we start out with is the driving question. Well, what is the driving question? And the driving question is the why, and the, and the how, and we take the driving question, and oftentimes it's based upon the standards of whatever uh, the curriculum that is being taught. But the driving question always has to solve the end product. Um, so the, then after the driving question, we'll go to our knows and need to knows. And this is a very important piece within project-based learning. And the problem, the, 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 the essential element of knows and need to knows, it helps the teacher and it helps the student, but it helps the teacher with any uh, um, assumptions that they may have on the student and what they learn. 
based upon the knows and need to knows, you might be able to move forward in the project or you'll know what workshops you need to cover within the project. Um, research is always taking place within the, the context of the framework of, of project-based learning. It's not just uh, an afterthought, we'll do some research. It's throughout the entire project. So using your knows and need to knows, as well as teacher experience, instead of doing a 75 minute lecture with all students, we'll run a, a workshop based upon what students really need. And then you're able to actually, not all students need the same workshop. And so students can continue on with their project and you're able to bring those students in that really need the workshop to get more one-on-one -on -one time and focus down on, on helping those students in those areas of need. So when we go back to the project cycle and we look at the framework, it all revolves around a rubric and the rubrics designed and developed by the teacher using the standards. One of the new things that we had, we have now that we didn't have 20 years ago when we first implemented project-based learning is the, is the technology to be able to do real-time imaging of the brain and what goes on in the brain um, when you're thinking about things or when you're doing things. So I want to ask everybody to reflect a moment and about that time that you had an epiphany about a problem, a complex problem you're trying to solve. Like you were struggling and struggling and struggling. And when did the solution pop into your head? Think about that uh, for, uh, for a moment. It would not surprise you that a large number of people would say, you know, I had that solution popped in my head while I was taking a shower or while I was working out and taking a walk. Or I was napping and I woke up and, I, and the solution popped in my head. Well, now we know the reason why. There's a lot of brain research around what we call default mode network of the brain and the task positive um, network of the brain. And what that is, is when you're doing a conscious task and you're focused, that lights up the task side of the brain. And you can see the uh, certain parts of the regions will light up and there's interconnectivity between those regions. Now, when you stop doing tasks and you go into this mindless state, then the brain switches into default mode. Now, let me point out that this is not an instant switch. Most people take about three hours to make that switch either way. It's like a light dimmer switch. And some people, especially some of the, the highly creative and, uh, and productive people I know, takes up to three days to make the switch. Now, the study has been, what is your brain doing when you're not in task positive no, um, uh, mode? And you, as you can see, there's more regions of the brain that light up and a much deeper level of interconnectivity of what's happening in the brain. Well, as they're studying this, it turns out there's a number of things. So when you listen to music, that's default mode. When you are exhibiting empathy and building relationships with someone, that's default mode. When you're reflecting on your past and projecting to the future, that's default mode. When um, you're, you're trying to under, create understanding of what a person is saying and listening, that's default mode. And when you have your epiphanies, like in the shower, where a solution hits you over the head, that's also in default mode. So it turns out that your deepest, richest thinking and the most creative thought happens when you're in default mode and when you're not doing active tasks. Now, contrast that to what we have been brought up in most schools or in when we go into a typical uh, meeting at a company. The first thing is we walk in, we have this agenda, all this series of tasks. And at the end of this, we're going to learn this. We're going to exit with these action plans, right? Which is all biased toward task, the task side of the brain. And yet we're expected to try to learn, to try to think deeply about things. And structurally, we've uh, stopped ourselves from doing that. So 
one of the things that some strategies, and this is why project-based learning in the process is so important, is when you ask an I wonder question, I wonder, what do I know? What do I need to know? That reflection is about curiosity. I wonder if I need more information. I wonder what if, you know, all these things are default modes. So that need to know in the project-based learning activates the deepest part of uh, learning of the brain. And what we have found, because it takes people um, at least three hours to make the switch, in the iterative cycle of project-based learning, the innovation here to kind of up the game on project-based learning is to separate the, uh, it's preferably separate days or different parts of the week, but at least different like different parts of the day at the beginning or end of the day, separate the default mode activities and the curiosity things versus the meetings about what are we going to do about the information and the action planning. So in project-based learning, the entry document, that's kind of task mode. The need to know is default mode, put that on a different day. The research and curiosity and digging through information is default mode, curiosity. And then you come back, okay, what are we going to do about it? And you create your execution path. And then you execute it and see where you end up. And if it's not in the right place, you iterate again. And that's the reason we kind of intuitively by just observing high performance teams kind of figured this out 20 years ago um, in this cycle. But now we know that it's biologically and neurologically rooted on why this process works. And you can optimize it by understanding, especially separating the time frame that you think in default mode versus task mode. So we will now enter into the uh, question uh, and answer uh, period. But instead of questions and answers in your normal Q&A, what I want you to think about is uh, ask your questions in kind of, I wonder, dot, 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 my aha and realization based on uh, what you've heard today. Oh, Super. Um, there we okay. go, Susan. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Do we have? Do we have, oh, Steve is muted. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. 20 Have minutes goes by fast, try to put everything in. Absolutely. So uh, we want to we wanna open up a couple of questions. But before we go there, it's like, how do you see that this concept that you have improved and systemized and really see how what works, what doesn't work, how to get an entire school district behind you, how to get teachers behind you. My husband's just coming in and is like totally confusing me. <laughs> do, you, do you have that sometimes when your spouse works into your office? Default mode. Like, where am I here? <laughs> yeah. ah, well, I think it's a good thing that you still can do that, right? So um, with so, all these different things that you have tried improvement, improved and like the excellence wins every day, right? Improve it time over time over time. And you have done it for so long now. How do you see this now going into a different language and a different and a different culture than we have in the US? And what are the opportunities here? So ironically, you know, some of the, the protocols that Ritz Carlton used and with Hortz, uh, you know, inspired the Ritz Carlton culture is the very thing that inspired the new techs and how the, that group scaled and how I've worked with all my teams. But I want to point out some very simple things that people can do today for themselves and in their households and in their, in, in their schools. Simply reorganize your schedule. Separate the default mode thinking and make agreements that we're not going to interpret the information. We're not going to analyze the information. All we're going to think about is ask, I wonder questions. And then on the next, on a different day, focus in on, okay, what, what information do we have? What do we think about it? What are we going to do about it? 
simply reorganized schedule. So at New Tech and with the deeper learning schools, and Stephen has done this so uh, consistently, is around you alter the schedule so they're all block scheduling. So instead of having these, you know, forty-five minute periods, you have fifty-minute periods. You have these longer periods that allows much deeper work and thinking. Um, so, so that's that's at- the first thing, Steve, Stephen. I was just going to say, yeah. So, you, so as a leader, you need to look at systems to be able to support teachers in a PBL environment. But I think the underlying thing that's been we've been talking about the whole time is you have to build that curiosity, and you have to give students that opportunity to process what it is that they're looking at and what they need or what they think they might need versus what we typically do in schools is we're going to open this chapter and we're going to read this and we're going to pre-teach something. Instead of pre-teaching, let's see what students come up with. Let's work with that. We still know we have to uncover the, the content. That's that's just a requirement. But there's much better ways than taking that pedagog- pedagogical approach for interdisciplinary, for real world, authentic learning. Um, and we're, I'm saying, you know, I've, I've worked with many schools all over the the world and we all have the same thing. We want the best for our students and all teachers do. And the, the students today are not the same students we had even 10 years ago. And so working with those students today is much different than if we were teaching 10 to 15 years ago, the students today are much more tech savvy that technology is actually being the driver uh, of learning today much more than it used to be. It gives us opportunities to create experiences where students can look at a problem in a kind of 360 fashion and it force it, and complex problems in this world are by nature interdisciplinary. You can't separate components. You have to look at all the interrelated pieces and with the richness of information and technology and using PBL, um, it, it allows you to to do that. One of the, I'm I'm looking at some of the um, the comments, and one person said that it seems that really the viewpoint of being it's it's being an active learner rather than just a receiver and a passive learner, and and that's true. I mean that's true across any PBL court class you go into. It is there's noise, it's messy, there's people moving around. But if you sat there and you listened as a facilitator, teacher, educator for a length of time, what you'll hear is more often than not, you'll hear students talking about their project, not, oh, what are you doing after school today or whatever. And what Ted talked about, I had to kick people out of the building. They wouldn't go home. They would, And if they saw a teacher's car in the parking lot on the weekend, they would come bang on the door And the teacher was that they're just getting something or whatever. And they ended up having to stay there. And they'd order the students. The students would come bang on the door and we'd have to get pizza come in. It was a phenomenon. It was a phenomenon that I was not used to. So Uh, um, I saw, I I wonder, um, um, uh, someone said, you know, what experiences prior to doing PPL in the school did we have uh, myself and Steven around what influenced uh, the PBL process. And for me, it was quite simple. I grew up as an expat kid, which meant that I had to, I hated school, number one. It was torture. Two is I, I had all kinds of a different experience of correspondence school, co- um, single room country, schoolhouse school, all of that. But none of, none of the schooling was consistent enough for me to, you know, it felt like a waste of time. So, um, one of the things that uh, my parents, uh, um, the gift they gave me was whatever I was curious about, they supported in providing as many resources as they could. And they weren't, they were not rich by any means, but they figured out how to spawn that curiosity further. So I learned very early the, the, the thirst for exploration and curiosity and, and how engaging that was. And second is how interesting the world is <laughs> in all of the different types of people in the complexity. And, um, and, not, and by, as a little kid, when you move between countries, you have to build instincts. You might under, not understand the language, but you have to understand people and what drives them. And so when I started my first company, my freshman year of college, some of the highest performing teams 
kind of by accident or default kind of worked in this PBL fashion. And we just happened to codify it even further. And then I happened to be part of an organization that also worked with Ritz Carlton and a few others. And then, so that had, you know, the, the huge impact on me. Yes. And I, I would say the similar experiences for me, I wasn't your best student. Um, and that was because I, I was all over the place and, and sitting there in a desk in a row and being lectured to, the teachers always said, oh, you're bright, you're bright. But I never showed it. And it wasn't until I got out of my formal years of education and got to the university that I got to drive the learning my way and the teaching my, the learning my way. And so that kind of sparked me into thinking there's got to be there there's definitely a better way but I'd been a high school principal for I'm working on 30 years close to 30 years now and most schools that in my past have always been driven by tests and student success based upon the state or test and it wasn't until like 2006 2005 when I said I'm done I'm going to do, we're going to do project-based learning. We're going to look at systems uh, changes. Um, we're not going to just focus on just the curriculum. We're going to bring in these essential skills that students need. Yes, they need the content, but they need to understand how to communicate with others. They have to know how to collaborate in today's world. Um, and what I found was that students who had not been successful, because you brought in these other essential elements that they were assessed on as well, they started getting success and they started having success, which then said, well, gosh, I'm doing OK. Now I can, as they focused on the curriculum, they were able to be successful in the curriculum because they got to experience some success in their so, life. So I saw a couple of comments that are I wonder is that kind of interrelated about adult and young kids and difference. And does it take longer as far as project based learning? My experience is that, and you, there's so much research right now in early childhood that I'm excited uh, about them involved with right now on, on programming. And it is, um, you know, how a baby learns to walk and talk in curiosity, experimentation, um, understanding what's going on around them. And also how the most innovative doctoral students or entrepreneurs and, and incubators and all that, all that crowd um, operates. It's exactly the same learning process. It's about curiosity. It's about engagement. It's about iteration. It's about tapping deep thinking and creating new neural pathways, which is the only way, not memorization and spitting out the answer. That doesn't create good neural pathways. No. But if you think about, you know, all of us have been exposed to projects at some point in our lives, but I can't remember anything I learned in school except for the projects. I could tell you the project of the solar system I did when I was in third grade. Right. And so that shows how strong that happens, what it does to your brain. So what works as babies works as well as adults. And all of us can create these uh, new neural pathways. Uh, and it, it's about it, the intention and knowledge that you can actually uh, you can actually do that. It's incredible. If we all remember how we learned when we were little and how much fun we had playing and just goofing around and how wonderful it was when our parents were like saying, good job, you know? Oh, yes. Sometimes I joke around with my German people because in Germany, it seems like that once people start going to school, they forget everything they were doing when kids were little trying to walk, right? They're trying to walk and they fall down and the parents say, oh, come on, let's try again. Nobody would ever say, oh, you fell once. You should never try that again. You, so you think about how fast kids learn how to walk and talk. It's incredible, mm -hmm. right? It goes up that positive years, right? And so at the, what we have found is especially with complex problems and deep thinking and what we want, you know, even adults to learn, project-based learning when done right and using, especially allowing for that default mode network to work, you come up with solutions and you learn much faster. That's why in the learning outcomes of Mutech network as a whole is far superior on the academic performance and off the charts compared to traditional learning. And they remember what they learned 10 years later. 
Whereas you could test kids a year later using traditional learning. They might have done well in the test, but they don't remember anything. I think the one thing that I see different between school districts and even countries are the learning outcomes. Because some, some situations, they may not have the technology. So technology to them might not be one of the big learning outcomes. But a learning outcome, what I see in most countries has always been around collaboration, creative thinking, um, critical thinking, creativity, um, and communication. Now you can bring in other things. When I first started out, I had 11 learning outcomes. There was way too many, but I, it's, it's going into this building this curiosity. And what we're finding is that by third grade, most schools in the U S anyway, they kill that curiosity because it's all about everybody. Everybody has to follow this in line. You all have to do the same thing. We all have to do that, you know, and, students learn from that experiment, that experiential learning of being creative and, and uh, curiosity building. That's I want to point out one thing about what Stephen just said on early childhood, pre three-year-old, when a kid has, let's say a, a group of kids, 90% deficits in executive function, you know, the, 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 the deeper learning things. And you focus only on that. Don't teach them reading. Don't teach them math. Don't teach them any of the academics. They end up closing those. When they close those brain gaps in executive function, they can close them in about six months. And they end up having double digit superior outcomes on reading and math and all the other things right after that. So by closing the executive functions, you get better on academics. And there are uh, several um, uh, uh, peer-reviewed research uh, um, studies that are coming out that completely backs that. And that's one of the things I've been involved with recently. It's really exciting. Uh, we have to meet again because I think we could talk another hour or so. I asked my team to open some after-hour uh, sessions so we can all can hang out and talk. But I want to stay on schedule. We're one minute away from closing out. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank and you, Pat. everyone. Uh, Pleasure. Please, if you want to hang out around, uh, we will open some sessions um, in a little bit. Sarah and I will be uh, getting on stage, um, saying our goodbyes, honoring the award ceremonies, also introducing our team. So thank you so much, Ted and Stephen, thank for you. your contribution. Pleasure. And, thank you, uh, Susan. See you soon. Yes. Absolutely.